everyone. Welcome back to another week of Bulletproof Hygiene. We are really excited to have you joining us this week, and I am grateful um, to have a really special guest with us today. I want to introduce you guys to Anne Rice. Anne Hello. Is... Hi, Anne. <laughs> she is a, she's one of us. She is a practicing hygienist. She's uh, practiced clinically for over 30 years. She received her degree from Wichita State University, and her oral systemic passion led her to found oral systemic seminars back in 2017, in which she now, because of that passion and that love, devotes her time, focus, and study primarily to dementia prevention and sleep hygiene. She completed the Bale Deneen Preceptorship for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention for Healthcare Practitioners. She is certified is a certified dementia practitioner and in 2020 became certified as a longevity specialist with the Alzheimer's Research and Dementia Foundation. She is a fellow with the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. You guys hear me prompt AOSH talk about AOSH <laughs> all the time. And in 2021, she published her manuscript, Alzheimer's Disease and the Oral Systemic Health, a bi-directional care integration improving outcomes. The perspective article was part of a research topic, Integrating Oral and Systemic Health, Innovations in Transdisciplinary Science, Healthcare, and Policy. She's also consulted with Wheel Cornell Medical Center's Alzheimer Prevention Clinic, Florida Atlantic Brain Health Center, and currently cons consults with Atria Institute and ADEX Medical. And Anne, I am so grateful to have you here with us today. Anne and I got to connect um, at the IBM conference earlier this year. She was speaking on this passion of the connection between oral health and, and how that plays into Alzheimer's. And Anne, I would love it if you would just share your story of how you transitioned from the hygiene chair to now working with Alzheimer's prevention and, and dementia. Oh, goodness. It's a long story, but um, you know, you never, never, but you don't see, sometimes you have intersections or opportunities that come up that you really wouldn't have ever thought before. I was a hygienist for probably 20, 20 plus years. And I started kind of looking into this oral systemic connection. Um, some things happened in my own family with people having cognitive decline and not altruistically. I wanted to figure out how it's not going to happen to me. Yeah. And as I started to do research, I read a paper, a methods paper um, by Dr. Richard Isaacson about how we're going to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And in that paper, it said sustaining good oral hygiene. And I went, okay, wow, let's look at this. And so I started to do a lot, a lot, a lot more research and figured out these connections. And I thought that I was placed in a good uh, position to help educate uh, the world, but providers about that we do specific things in the operatory and we need to broaden our perspective of that. We need to look at all of the downstream effects of what we do. Yes, we're gonna treat periodontal disease and we might not lose teeth and all of those other things, but really I think the primary focus is all the other impacts that treating a bacterial infection does to the rest of the body. And so I just really primarily focus on the brain um, I am presenting a little bit of a cardiovascular course here in a couple weeks, but primarily it's brain health. That's awesome. What does your role currently look like? You're not doing any chair side time right now, correct? I sometimes temp, so okay. um, which is, uh, you know, I didn't really um, understand the difference between satisfaction at the chair side at the operatory, right? versus delayed gratification. So when you go into the operatory, you immediately get gratified. You get this um, feedback back and forth. But when I'm at home in my office, I don't necessarily get that feedback. So I do like going into the operatory. But what I do now is we have cases, people that were trying to prevent cognitive decline. They oftentimes have a risk, a genetic risk uh, for cognitive decline. And I take the oral health Part of that. So we, of course, do salivary diagnostics. We get evaluations from, from providers like you. Um, I was going to send a case to you and then her movement of that patient um, didn't let me send them to uh, a provider like yourself. And then we treat the disease. I also have the opportunity to look at all the blood biomarkers. I can see C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, MPO. And so I have a luxury that a lot of clinicians don't. 
I can see all that. And then the direct relationship, when we treat these people's diseases, we see all of those inflammatory markers go down. We see cholesterol improvements. Um, so I'm lucky. I, I get to work it all together. And I work with people that are incredibly brilliant. And so I learn things every day, which I love doing that. Yeah, that's awesome. And I hope, you know, you're right. I, and I, if I'm being honest, I'm jealous that um, obviously <laughs> you have the opportunity to see all those other markers. And I have embarked recently, I am now working with, um, I partnered with a functional medicine doctor here in my area who is sending me patients. And so we're, you know, connecting back and forth over what those biomarkers look like and how things are changing and improving. And so that is really, really fun. Um, it is. And it's really allows us to see what we're truly doing. And I am hoping, and I, as I know you are, that this is where we are going in the future, that this will not just be a, you know, a small circumstance here and there, but this is where we're going. And so on that front, you know, around our conversation today about brain health and, and what we can do as hygienists, I want to just touch and start with first, what are kind of the, some of the current stats on brain disease within, within our country and what do we have facing us right now? Um, so their perspective look uh, at the future is 13 million people in the United States will have, this is just Alzheimer's disease. So remember that dementia is the umbrella term that houses Alzheimer's disease. So yes. I'm just telling you about Alzheimer's. We have vascular dementia. We have Lewy body. We have hundreds of different causes of cognitive decline. So this is just that part of under this umbrella and then 131 mil, uh, million worldwide. But what is startling to me is the statistic that 46 million Americans right now have Alzheimer's disease in their brains. So it's asymptomatic, right? So right. what we don't wanna do is convert. We wanna live a long life, never get symptoms. We're gonna pass away of something else. So that statistic to me is even more shocking. And we know that comorbid factors, diabetes, and all these other influences increase your risk. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, one of the reasons that I wanted to have this podcast today is because as hygienists, we have a really big role to play in helping decrease the prevalence of dementia and cognitive right. decline. And, yep. and I want to just back up because just saying that sentence makes me want to stop for a second and point out that there is prevention. It is possible to take a step back, to decrease, to improve cognitive decline, that it's not just something that we're genetically determined for us. Like, no, we have no, 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 no. This is, this is how it's going. And I want to make that point to the, the hygienist listening that, you know, it's not just, it is what it is. Like we have a chance to reverse this. And so I know that genetics obviously can set the table, but they don't necessarily serve the meal, if, if you will. So right. will you speak Good. to that? Absolutely. So there are genetic risk factors that give you a higher risk, but there are plenty of people that have no genetic risk and have Alzheimer's disease. So, and this is probably a poor analogy, but we say that genes load the gun, but behavioral, lifestyle, medical comorbid conditions actually pull that trigger. So what you do for your cardiovascular health is almost directly related for brain health. And there's some other little caveats. There's lots of, of different, what we call modifiable risk factors. So what are you going to do? Of course, healthy diet and all those things. Lancet estimates that 40% of Alzheimer's cases are preventable by lifestyle and behavioral modifications. Wow. So that just right there could uh, cut down our, our risk so much and have um, so many less numbers. Yeah. Wow. So I say that all the time, and you know this, especially with temping, that um, we as hygienists get so overwhelmed with all the daily uh -huh. minutia of our time constraints, the patient difficulties, yes. the team frustrations, and you know, just the million balls that we're trying to juggle. And it seems like the thought of doing more um, or different feels almost like the straw that can break the camel's back. But in light of these dire consequences of us not fully stepping into our roles as preventative healthcare providers, you know, we got to step up to the plate and figure out how to shift our approach and do the right thing. And it's not just a cliche to say that our patients' lives and quality of life depend on it. So that being said, knowing what you know and knowing from the hygienist standpoint, 
what would you say are the top three things that we as hygienists or dental professionals can do to make an impact on cognitive decline? Uh, I'll start with the treating of the bacterial infection that we know is periodontal disease. That in and of itself is complicated. So we have to educate ourselves of what the new science says. Science last week is archaic. Yeah. We were looking for science next week. If I did dental hygiene the way I was taught 30 years ago, you need to take my license because that is across the board, not the right thing to do. So treating the disease, but then you're preventing the disease. In my patients, I need no inflammatory. I, I need no inflammation. I don't want the inflammatory response. I don't want the cytokines. I don't, I don't want any of that world. How am I going to treat the disease? I got to find out that they have it. Okay. So gingivitis, there's a response to something right? We know that there's a disease process beginning. I think salivary diagnostics is critically important. We do that in our patients. Um, once we have the probe, we see the numbers go up. We see the bleeding. It's already taken hold. We, yeah. it, it's already in, it's a bacterial infection that has crossed over the epithelium and now could be getting into the endothelium, we'll go to the heart and all of those things. So we already know that there's a process. So I think treating periodontal disease um, and preventing it is critical. I think that blood pressure, a scrutiny of a health history, um, a health history is there not to check off a box. We've checked the health history. We've done the blood pressure. I'm going to put that into my chart. Um, there's a whole thing to unpack with health history. And I understand that we don't have a lot of time, but unfortunately our patients are sick. They are on medications. They have diseases that affect your treatment. So blood pressure, we know that um, elevated blood pressure in midlife doubles your risk for Alzheimer's disease. These are the patients that may present as a thin, normal, not an obese, we're not profiling, they don't look, they don't look the part, but they have half of America has hypertension. So that's half your patients. And then what, ones of those are actually being treated with medications or diet or not all the rest. I think that taking blood pressure, giving that information to the patient. One of the things that I've just recently mentioned um, in some of my courses is that, and I, and I only thought about this lately when I was temping, what is your office protocol for elevated blood pressure? Where is in your um, notes that the office has come to this policy of this person is at 170 over whatever, 150 over this. What is the protocol for these numbers? You don't need to get up and go ask the doctor every single time. Right. You know, when do you refer that person? When do you have a conversation with their doctor? When do you give them ideas for a diet? And I'm not saying that you're telling them that they're overweight. I'm saying for lowering blood pressure, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. You have relationships with patients that you could just pull that diet out of the drawer, just hand it to them and say, here, just try this maybe, which we know works. So right. blood pressure and a scrutiny over the health history for brain health. And then lastly, airway, as you know, um, that is critically important. And listen, when we assess airway, your, your brain needs oxygen. It uses 20% of our oxygen to to work properly, including blood flow, and we can get into vascular health, but an assessment of airway takes no time at all. If you suspect it, if they say that they're snoring, snoring is never benign, they're, they're, something's happening. It doesn't matter whether you do those appliances in your practice. It's not about the plastic material. It's not about any of that. It's about the person's health. Refer them to somebody who can treat their airway, get them a home sleep test. There's just looking in the mouth at different factors. That's super quick. The conversation about airway. And listen, when you get their airway treated, you're going to get the periodontal disease treated a little bit more quickly too, because yeah. you're swimming upstream in an airway patient trying to get the dysbiotic environment under wraps. Yes. So, I, yes. Um, I, I feel that I'm hitting my head against the wall in some of these patients. Absolutely. You have to treat airway in order to help the pathogens that are growing in the mouth. So um, really it would be blood pressure scrutiny over the health history, um, 
the airway and then treating periodontal pathogens, which is not easy. I mean, you know, now I'm reading so much about PG that everybody likes to do all the information about and the research about PG, how many different strains there are. <laughs> we don't talk about that. Um, what do they do? What do we know about it? I, microbiology is fascinating to me. We're doing the best we can with what we know right now. It doesn't mean that we quit, um, but always staying abreast of what's coming. Yeah. And I, I want to segue into that conversation because to me, and I know you said it too, I mean, salivary diagnostics, they're imperative. They're critical to being able to know what's actually happening. And I want to flip it. Obviously, like you said, the reality is we have a lot of sick patients. So, you know, we need it to know what, what we're dealing with and what's driving the infection and the inflammation. But if we're going to be truly preventative, if that's our goal and that's where we're heading, then we need to be testing our healthy patients too to detect right. that subclinical before it starts to ramp up. Right. So, you know, I know there's a lot of hygienists that listen that are listening that have not yet dipped their toe in the water of doing salivary diagnostics because it feels overwhelming you know and and I'll just speak very vulnerably and candid, candidly I do salivary testing on a lot of my patients my functional medicine doctor that's referring me patients does it in her practice so she's sending me patients that we know already have dysbiosis and have some issues she needs me to help work on that um and it is a little overwhelming and a little daunting because the reality is Every patient is so specifically different. There is no cookie cutter approach. So I will try something. And for some patients that works beautifully and we're done. But I'm seeing some patients where I'm still not able to get this under control. And that's where we have to work together as a medical team, because that tells me, hey, like these few things we tried didn't work. We had to try some other things. But if we're still hitting our head against the wall, that's when I start going, okay, you know, I've been talking to you a while about airway. And I know you've kind of been resistant to that. It's time. We've got to do a sleep study because the, the, the things that we've done should have been successful. This means there's something else. There's a bigger part to the picture. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of hygienists kind of stick their head in the sand and go, I don't want to get into all that. I don't have time for that. I don't know how to manage that, but I think we have to. And I love what you said. And I think it's so true about, you know, what we learned last week doesn't apply anymore. It's, it's what's, what's happening now. And there's so much coming to light too, with, you know, the gut health part of this and the, yes. the microbiome, you know, from the brain to the mouth, to the gut, it's, it's all interrelated. So we have a responsibility on that front too, to stay really current. Right. I, I use a comparison and I was talking to our, a mutual friend that we have, um, about if you're a cardiologist, I have a cardiologist, if he or she graduated 20 years ago. Do I want him or she, her to practice cardiology that they learned 20 years ago? Uh, oh, heavens, no. And it is complicated. I, I, there's a dentist that I have a conversation with and should, this is just a ring out their thought, should dental hygiene, dental hygienist, should you pull up your stakes out of your practice and move yourself to your functional office? Should that where hygiene moved to is in medicine to some respect, right. because it gets the blood biomarkers. Listen, if you are trying to treat periodontal disease and that person is an undiagnosed uh, diabetic, how, how are you going to do treating your perio? Good? No, right. you're not. Right. So, so much of this is connected. And then we have success. We have more success if we can tease out all these other factors. Um, yeah, I guess I, it is daunting. We're doing the best, you know, that we can with the time. Every practice is different. I, uh, another thing that you said about you've tried this and it didn't work, but it worked for this person. It is the same thing as your doctor. You have high blood pressure and they put you on lisinopril and it didn't work for you don't get all upset and then take the marbles and go home and say, that didn't work. Nope. Right. We're going to come up with another strategy. We're going to do another medication. We're going to do something different. And he checks or she checks to see if it did work. A1C, I don't get on metformin and then you never check my numbers again. Right. That would be frightening. Right. Well, so, 
It's interesting that you say that because I just had a patient um, last week who had uh, had surgery for sleep apnea about eight years ago. And as I'm looking in their mouths, there's a lot of signs that I'm seeing that make me think, I'm not sure that is completely resolved. And so I asked, you know, hey, did you ever do a follow-up study just to see? And she said, no, actually I didn't. She goes, and honestly, like when I first got diagnosed, I wasn't really a snore. I didn't have the classic signs. She said, but I didn't. And I said, I would love for you to. And thank goodness she's already emailed me and said, I've already scheduled that, which is awesome. Um, but it, you're right. You know, we what we're doing is a practice. It is mm-hmm. not a perfection. So we've got to always keep trying and keep moving. And and we we don't want that patient to give up on us. We can't give up on them. It is a constant journey. And I always say to my patients, I'm here with you in this. We're doing this together. Right. That's a good clinician. It's hard though. It is. I don't, especially me temping. I mean, I, I understand not every practice and we're in situations because we're in those, we have to work in certain areas and, um, but there's little minute tweaks you can do in in your operatory. Maybe you aren't going to do the whole buffet of everything but you could do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. I think honestly, the most magic happens. What we, the one thing that I think we get to do that makes the most difference is empowering the patient. We have mm-hmm. that very special relationship with the patient as the hygienist. You know, they, they want to come in and tell us all about their latest vacation and, you know, what happened, how's your family? And there's just that, there's that strong communication and relationship between us that also when they when we make recommendations they they do those things they take those things so i think there is a big opportunity for us if nothing else to empower the patient and say hey your blood pressure is very concerning to me this is not something that we've seen in the past this is getting higher and higher for you i i think this is something we need to take very seriously and i want you to go talk to your physician about it and i've had those patients that we've done that for and they came back and said you know my physician said it's really no big deal and i'm like you know what honestly i think you need to find a new physician right so, you know and that's the hard part on our on our side too is you know we we are very limited with what we can do on this side that's why mm-hmm. we need to work collectively and not all of medicine is ready to do that so it's just sometimes empowering that patient it's having those conversations over and over i have a patient that i have been seeing for years and have been trying to get him to do a sleep study i have an ent that i work with that knows all of airway and does sleep studies himself and um, I actually just saw him last week too. And he said, Teresa, I got really busy this summer. He said, but I'm, I'm going to make an appointment with him today. I'm like, excellent. Because I can tell that, you know, we're working really hard. Right. This is a barrier for us. So, you know, that's, that's the other thing is it is, you know, they say you eat the elephant one bite at a time, which I was thinking about the other day. That's such a strange statement because none Isn't of it? Eat the elephant, but, um, at least I hope we don't, but anyway, Um, sometimes it's that sometimes it's just those minute conversations at every visit where we're encouraging and, you know, opening in a new concept and, you know, helping the patient understand so that they can be their own best advocate. Yeah. And I think having a, I mean, this is, we have many professional friends that talk about the motivational interviewing and how to talk to a patient. It is not talking at them and it's not browbeating them that they didn't floss enough. Yes. Um, yes. We just had Dr. Susan Maples with us um, a few weeks ago. And yes, she was, that was our co- topic of conversation. Yeah. yeah that that, that ship has sailed and, and uh, a little more understanding and then getting other professions to understand that's not easy at all. Every specialty um, we know about pregnancy, we know about all the outcomes, but some of the other um, healthcare entities really don't. Everybody is busy. Far, I would say a lot of them are far busier than we are in dentistry. Um, and it's having that conversation, having the public more uh, understand when the, when the public's educated, they then come to us and go, what can you do for me, Teresa? How can you, I heard this, I read this. Uh, I think that that's important too. We educate the public and then they will turn around and then perhaps educate their physician or other groups as well. Yeah, I wanna ask you, this is gonna seem like a very basic question to you because this is what you do and you know it so well, but I'm asking this because I know we have some listeners out there 
who don't <laughs> necessarily really know and understand. Just give us a, a basic overview. Why does airway contribute to cognitive decline? Oh my, uh, oxygen. Okay, so we'll just do nasal breathing. We'll just do that. Okay. Um, we know that we get more oxygen breathing through our nose than through our mouth. Your brain thrives on oxygen. 20% of our blood flow and 20% of our oxygen flow. Um, everything works with air, pr proper oxygen. If you look at, um, for instance, you take a Panorex x-ray and on that x-ray, you see a carotid calcification, which we all need to know what that is. There's a little blockage right there. So we're losing blood flow to the brain, which then in turn, we're losing oxygen flow to the brain. All the neurons need oxygen to survive. And then when you're struggling to breathe, all the inflammatory responses go. Everything is on fire. We think we're gonna die. We're not breathing. Then all of the inflammatory cascade goes to that. Now, if you're mouth breathing, the dysbiotic environment, the growing of those high-risk pathogens, everything is offset with not being able to particularly nasal breathe. Um, mouth breathing is a whole nother part to that. We do know that people, and of course they've tested CPAPs because that's the primary, that's what we primarily use. We know that you can course correct cognitive decline to a degree. Now this is not, you're not curing Alzheimer's disease with a CPAP. Right. Let me make no mistake. But we know that we can get, once we get better air, better oxygen and flow to the brain, it's going to tamp down a little bit of the cognitive deficit. It is now recommended out of the neurology groups that every person needs to be assessed for airway to reduce the risk of cognitive decline. And this goes on for years. Think about in um, premenopausal and postmenopausal women, the dramatic increase of airway issues, it goes up almost 7% just in a matter of years. But then the women are struggling, they're not going to go to the doctor, they get fragmented sleep, whether that's from full ap apneic events, or uh, it gets complicated into airway things, but everyone has to be uh, uh, assessed for airway. And then the dysbiotic, and you know, just as well as I do with all the pathogens um, in that environment. And the, inflam the inflammatory reaction to apnea is horrible for the body. Yeah. If you had a patient that came in and they're on a second blood pressure medicine, they've been on lisinopril and they've been on that for years and suddenly you see another one. Bob, you're on another, yeah, the other one wasn't working. Well, there's a couple red flags. Um, a dysbiotic, do we, are we looking at periodontal disease? Because we know that subgingival periodontal pathogens increases both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And we know that periodontal disease does not help those blood pressure medications work. Um, where else was I going with, with blood? Oh, so the second blood pressure medication. What about their airway? Because we know that when you cannot breathe, your blood pressure is going to go up. So second blood pressure medication on that health history could alert two different things, a dysbiotic mouth, and then also an airway issue. So all of this dramatically goes together. Vascular dementia, we didn't talk about that. Um, your vessels, miles and miles of vessels in your brain, and it needs proper blood flow. Um, and we know that vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease tend to go hand in hand, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanna make just a little shift here because I think, um, and I talk to a lot of hygienists and I feel like there's kind of this, overall feeling of kind of intimidation when we think about talking to patients about their body health and especially things like obesity and diet and exercise. Um, mm -hmm. It can feel taboo and more geared for their medical experts. But in reality, like I said, we see these patients more frequently than their physicians do. And metabolic health and diet are huge when it comes to maintaining brain health. So would you share some ideas for how we can talk to our patients about these issues and make good nutrition recommendations to, to support health? So like I said, we're just trying to like stay afloat talking about how to, you know, keep your mouth clean. 
But we got to consider that if diet and nutrition aren't in place, that that's going to be a whole nother stumbling block or, or roadblock to achieving that health. Okay. So the question was really how to a clinician that is perhaps not knowing how, how to discuss these things with the patient. And that's all I'll go with. So okay. base it on what you do. Okay. Don't, you're not going to talk about all of their cardiovascular health. We're going to just focus on periodontal disease. We'll just stay in your own wheelhouse. Perfect. And we know that proper nutrition helps their disease. We know that about omega-3s. We know B vitamins, for instance, is going to help you treat their periodontal disease. It helps with wound healing. We know that omega vitamins help with periodontal disease. So base this all on their disease and what you're doing. You could do diet recommendations. Say that somebody does not have dysbiotic environment. You can congratulate them for their overall nutrition. You could bring it in that way. Or you can say, listen, we want to keep you healthy. So just keep in mind that all your nutrition does impact your mouth. So let's talk about your vitamins. Let's talk about more whole foods. Let's talk about all the things that are going to bring them up. You can leave the systems almost out of it, right? We're not weighing our patients yet. You're not telling them that they're obese. Just right. stick with what you're doing, which is the periodontal disease. And there's lots of, you can reach out to me. I have tons of studies about all these different nutrients and how it helps with periodontal disease. Just stick with that. Get one big sheet and print that out to your patient. These whole foods are going to help as opposed to these inflammatory, inflammatory foods. Obesity, that's a whole nother can of worms. I'm putting a presentation together and there's a big section um, about obesity and really what um, that tissue is actually doing and how that can contribute to the periodontal um, cascade as well. It, it obviously it all works together, but just don't think so big. Just yeah. think about what, with what you do. Yeah, that's perfect. I love that. I love that idea um, about just making, you know, I, I like the idea because when we talk to patients about a lot of things that they, they kind of get overwhelmed, yep. but maybe making a sheet of, Hey, here's some great vitamins to consider. Here's some, you know, some foods to incorporate some, and some inflammatory foods to, you know, take away and right. just give them like a basic starting point. That's a great idea. I have seen, and I know you would, you would ascribe to this as well, but so many of my patients who have made a, a health shift for themselves where they really are eating whole foods and, and avoiding process. Of oh my course. gosh, their, their gums look completely different. It's right. Amazing. Of course. Yeah. But that's, if it was just that simple, right. that a right. hygienist is going to be able to say this, and then they're going to have a whole change in dietary patterns. So that's, it's the same thing when you put a, a plan together, um, water flossing, interproximal, and this, 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 and this, and you have a laundry list of things right. to do. They'll do nothing. Right. So each visit, have another nutrient, have another, that this is what you're going to focus for three months worth of patients. You're only going to talk about omega-3s. And then the next three months from May to August, we're going to talk about B vitamins. And then August to fall, all your patients, you're going to talk about this and, yeah. and work on it that way. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Well, I want to say thank you for your passion and expertise and time and what you are doing for the patients and really for our profession. Um, I know you spend a good deal of time. You talked about, you know, making, creating presentations. I know you're, um, you know, rounding the country. So I wanted um, our listeners to know that they can see you later this year. You're going to be at Hygiene Under One Roof, correct? I am. I am. Mm -hmm. Yep. And ADHA in the first of the month. Awesome. And of course, AOSH. Yes. Yes. Uh, of course. Um, and I'm going to put your website link in the show notes so our listeners can dig in and find out more. Um, do you want to leave us with any final thoughts on this topic? Um, yeah, I sort of do. And, uh, you know, things change when you have experiences. I, I, I also want us to start to consider, um, and I'm going to talk about this. Angie Stone and I are going to be doing a, and I don't know when this is going to air, 
but we're doing a charity CE about Alzheimer's disease. And in that, um, I talk about how to make your practice dementia friendly. There's lots of opportunities for that. If you have, the practice needs to be on alert for those types of things with some of your patients. But I also, if you have this in your life, as many of us do, um, it is not to be afraid of. Um, the loved ones that have this disease are the same loved ones that you had 30 years ago. Um, there are some good things that are, are on, on the other side of this as well. Um, it is something to be concerned about and to live our lives but that this whole dementia community is a community of loving, wonderful people, um, whether they come into your office or they're your family members that you spend time with. And I just think that we all need to um, go more with kindness in this population. Mm -hmm. I, I understand it gets frustrating. I, I understand that, but it's all about kindness and love and support of this population. Yeah, I love that. That's so, so true. Kindness goes a long way. It does. Well, Anne, I really am appreciative of your time. Like I said, thank you so much for joining us and for talking about this. And I'm sure um, we're going to see and hear from you in the future as well. Thanks, um, Teresa. But thank you for forging ahead. And yes. This has been really helpful to everyone, I'm sure. So I hope everyone has a really great week this week. Um, and we will see you next time. As usual, feel free to reach out on our Mighty Network if you have questions or thoughts. And let's have a conversation about this. What's working for you guys? What have you come across? How are you educating patients? Like, let's do this together. Everybody have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody.